Hey, I'm Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, especially in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. This Archaeology 101 series is a, basically just a modified version of some of the classes that I've taught at the University of Arkansas and also at Tennessee. Only with this, I don't have to worry about exams or grades or anything like that. So this episode is about zooarchaeology, or zoarch, as it's usually abbreviated. Zooarchaeology is the study of how people lived in the past through the lens of animal remains that are found on archaeological sites. So we as zooarchaeologists aren't really interested in the animals themselves. That would be paleontologists. We are interested in how people in the past have interacted with the animal kingdom for food, medicine, tools, religious, paraphernalia, spirituality, pets, and so on. In practice, the cornerstone of zooarchaeology is the comparative collection. So that's part of the reason that I came to the University of Tennessee for my graduate research in the first place. <clears throat> we have the uh, biggest collection of animal remains in the eastern U.S. outside of the Smithsonian. Um, so basically it's a library, but instead of books, it's full of boxes of animal skeletons that we use to confirm our identifications in the lab. The first thing I've got to talk about are the four biases. These affect the entire process of site formation from when humans lived on or worked at a site all the way through to the final analysis of what gets excavated. So the first bias is the deposition bias, which is caused by the fact that animal remains don't accumulate on a site unaltered. Some bones are useful as tools, so they might get broken up or carved up on site and taken away or partially destroyed, things like that. Some animals are eating bones and all, uh, especially like small rodents and small birds and things like that. So they will get digested and possibly excreted on a totally different site and never make it into the assemblage that we're analyzing in the first place. Uh, sometimes large animals are butchered at a kill site and then some, you know, less useful bones are left behind and the rest are taken back to the main camp, kind of reducing the weight load. Um, some animals also might be considered especially sacred and so their remains are disposed of with fire or in caves or thrown into water um, or otherwise disposed of in a way that makes it so that we're not going to find them when we excavate a site. So not all parts of the animals that people used in antiquity actually end up on whatever site that we're excavating and analyzing. The second bias is the preservation bias, and that's just the fact that not all animal remains survive to be excavated in the first place. And decomposition doesn't affect all um, elements and all animals equally. Dogs, coyotes, other kind of scavenging animals will chew up bones and drag them away. Bones that were broken open for marrow have more surface area to them. So that and that surface area is exposed to the soil. The soil may be acidic, which breaks them down more quickly. The bones that weren't broken open. Plant roots can grow into uh, cavities or foramina in the structure of bones. And as those roots grow, they'll break the bones apart. Big bones like deer femurs and certain cranial elements and things are much bigger or much more dense and so they'll survive much longer than small bones like uh, squirrel ribs or small bird bones or things like that. So if bones were burned they also tend to survive longer but burning can also increase the fragmentation rate which makes it more difficult for us to identify them. So the study of these processes of decay and bone modification after they've been left behind at a site is called taphonomy. And taphonomy is a science in, in and of itself. Um, and a lot of zooarchaeological literature is really focused on understanding these taphonomic processes. You can see by its, uh, its face-like qualities that it is a face because that is what it is. Additionally, you see this elongated skull. So we know that uh, this is a signal to aliens, uh, that, a signal from aliens to us that they exist. You can see by it, even from its profile from multiple angles, it still looks like a face. Therefore, it is a face. Yeah, if you change the lighting, it's you can kind of see how it's still a face. As you can see by the back of it, that's the back of its head and it doesn't matter. So there's nothing. 
Yeah. Well, I'm convinced. <laughs> Ancient astronaut theorists say yes. <laughs> Recovery biases are at play during the excavation of a site. So in the old days, archaeologists didn't necessarily screen for artifacts and everything or most of everything was recovered by hand as they were digging. So the biggest bones from the largest animals were recovered um, with much higher frequency and regularity. Smaller specimens were never seen, recognized, or, or excavated in the first place. So these days, depending on the scope of the project, we'll pretty much always be using at least quarter inch mesh screens for artifacts and specimen recovery. That's pretty much standard throughout the country, which works well for most animal taxa, but still allows for smaller elements from things like fish, rodents, small birds, eggshells, things like that to be left behind, wind up in the backfill piles. So we also will tend to take a sample from each excavation unit or something, some kind of subsample, and run that through an eighth inch screen in order to estimate what we were missing in the quarter inch screen. Again, depending on the scope of the project and what we're actually doing there. And then finally, there's identification bias. Some animals are easier to distinguish from others. Some bones are easier to distinguish or identify than others. So for instance, with deer, their metapodials, the metatarsals and the metacarpals, have ridges running down them that accommodate for tendons to, to fit in those ridges. And they're pretty identifiable as compared to kind of random mid-shaft fragments from humerus or femur, which might be very difficult to identify. So sometimes those elements can be overrepresented in an identified sample. You also will see that some analysts are more experienced than others, and so they're able to make much more precise identifications with greater degrees of confidence than uh, more novice analysts. Um, so that's something else that we also have to have to keep in mind. Some analysts are also more experienced with very particular taxa, um, while others are relatively inexperienced with those taxa. So there are only a few people that really specialize in fish, for instance. So those few people are going to have a much greater resolution on their um, on that part of their assemblages when they do analysis compared to the people who do more terrestrial vertebrates, um, like, like most archaeologists tend to focus on. So all of these biases are going to distort the resolution of what we can actually deduce about what life with animals was like in the distant past. But the more data you've got, the clearer that picture tends to be. Most of the landmark sites have tended to have analyses that involve you know thousands or tens of thousands of specimens rather than a few hundred. So at that point it's an issue of statistical analysis rather than uh, focusing on really individual specimens or elements. Now there's an obvious problem with uh, simply counting up the number of bones from each species to estimate how much um, that you know, species or taxon contributed to, say, the diet or, or whatever of the people living at the site. So deer, for instance, have all of their metacarpal bones fused into a single bone uh, on, each, on each foot, whereas something like a dog does not have that fusion pattern going on. So you might find, you know, four or five dog metapodials that corresponds to one foot in the same way that a single deer metapodial also corresponds to a single foot element. So if you're just counting numbers of, of bones or bone fragments, that is going to artificially inflate how well certain taxa are represented in your assemblage. So in order to kind of compensate for that, we can also calculate what's called an MNI or minimum number of individuals. And that's a fairly simple estimation. If you've got four right femurs and two left femurs and a right and a left mandible from say like a white tailed deer, then you have at least four deer represented at that site because no deer has two left femurs. Now, if you've got four very small left femurs and one of those mandibles is really, really robust, that's probably indicative of either four young and one old or four young and maybe female 
um, and one adult male. So that's going to show you that there's at least five deer represented in your assemblage. So it's really more of an estimation than it is an actual like, rigid calculation, but it's still helpful in order to help compensate for those kind of fragmentation patterns and the fact that different animal species have different numbers of bones in their body. Now, as I mentioned before, sometimes bones are broken open for fatty marrow, which is also going to inflate certain um, element numbers in your, in your generalized assemblage. So when bones are broken open for things like marrow, uh, this has to be done fairly shortly after the death of the animal. If the bone has been sitting around on the surface for, say, like a decade, then there won't be any marrow left. Ants will have gotten in there or other animals will have extracted that marrow and, and consumed it or it will have leaked out and gotten to the soil around it. Very conveniently, bones break with different fragmentation patterns if they're broken shortly after the animal dies compared to bones that were broken many years after the animal died. Perimortem fracture patterns, which are the breaks that happen near the time of the animal's death, tend to have much more smooth surfaces to them and more curved or spiraling fracture patterns while postmortem fractures or breaks that happen long after the animal has died tend to be more rough and create more right angle breaks than curved or spiraling uh, breaks. And this is most well understood and most reliable on medium and large mammals like deer, bison, or elk. Because of these breaking tendencies and assemblage created by people who are actively cracking open bones from marrow will have more perimortem fractures than one in which breaks happened long after the bones were buried or discarded. But we can take this fragmentation question a step further though. Once bone has been broken open from marrow, there's still more nutrients like fats and proteins in the bone fragments themselves, and these can be boiled out for, um, it's, it's kind of like if you make like a beef stew or something like that, and all those fats, once you put it back in the refrigerator, like the leftovers, all those fats raise to the surface and create kind of a, um, uh, a fatty like skin on the top. It's the, basically the same idea. You can scrape that off and then put it in a container and use it for a cooking fat or something like that uh, at a later date. And ethnographers have observed this practice, especially in societies that don't have dairying livestock like goats or deer or, or sheep. So it takes some extra work, but breaking down these bones into small fragments makes it maximizes the amount of bone that you can fit into your boiling pot or pit or whatever, and it reduces the amount of water that you need, which then makes it so that you can heat up that water faster using less fuel, less time, so on. It increases the efficiency to break these, these bone fragments down, and ethnographically the range tends to be between about two and five centimeters in maximum length, or sometimes slightly longer six, seven centimeters. That means that if the size range of our bone fragments in the, in, you know, the assemblage uh, tend to fall between two and five centimeters or so, then the reason for that is probably bone boiling. And then taking that line of reasoning another step further, this kind of bone processing is really labor intensive. It requires a lot of people and a lot of resources, firewood, so on. Um, and it, so it tends to get done in bulk by a lot of people all at once. And it's unlikely to be done at hunting camps where you just have like three or four people out hunting, butchering, and then bringing the relevant parts of the animals back uh, to the main base camp. Generally, if we see this kind of bone fragmentation, we're probably looking at a base camp itself. So, uh, for instance, Lewis Benford observed this practice at the Nunamute winter camps just before the Nunumut left for their spring camps. The Nunumut are a indigenous people from northern Alaska that he was studying back in the late 70s to uh, observe these kinds of uh, hunting and animal processing practices uh, by people who had been doing it as an integral part of their uh, way of life for long periods of time. Not unaltered, but still harvesting fundamentally the same kinds of animals with similar um, fundamental needs that they had to meet. So we can also see indications of what seasons a particular site was being occupied based on the archaeofaunal record. Uh, depending on the severity of the winter, a lot of turtle species go into a hibernation-like state called brumation. Um, 
where they're actually underwater. And that makes them very hard to find or trap or catch or like they're basically unavailable during that time of the year. So if we're finding these kinds of animals like um, snapping turtles or something on a site mixed with other food refuse, then it's a good bet that this site was being occupied in more summer, spring, maybe early fall months. Uh, famously, various waterfowl like geese and swans are migratory. So if you have an understanding of the schedule of those migrations, when those birds are available in certain parts of the country, uh, at what times of year, then you can use that to estimate if you've got those birds in your assemblage, when uh, they're even available to be hunted and then could end up in that refuse. Perinatal animals can also be used to estimate seasonality. Perinatal it means around the time of birth. Um, they might have still been in utero, but they also might have just very recently been born. Some taxa like foxes are born during very specific times of the year, and they have a fairly short gestation period. So if you have you know these um, perinatal, very, very juvenile, fox elements represented in your sample then that indicates a you know spring seasonality then there's also tooth eruption schedules several studies have tracked the rate at which animal like uh, white-tailed deer their teeth erupt from the gums and juvenile teeth are replaced by adult teeth and things like that so if you have deer mandibles and or at least a few of those mandibles have teeth that are in the process of erupting then you can estimate the season of death because white-tailed deer are born within about a two-month window. In my area, it's between May and June. So, like I said, if you have a mandible that's got particular teeth that are in the process of erupting, you can calculate how old that deer was in terms of a range of months and then calculate that against a May-June birth, um, birth season to figure out what time of year that animal died. There are, of course, a bunch of other questions that archaeology can be used to answer. I haven't talked about anything involving domesticated animals or historic period stuff, for instance, but I think that is enough to cover for an introductory episode. Um, if you've got any questions about this or anything else archaeologically related, related, of course, you can drop those questions down in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.